just as a reminder to everyone, um, this is being recorded. And if you want your CMEs or CEUs, please sign your name into the chat. Um, so you're ready to begin? All right. Um, good afternoon and welcome uh, to our third webinar in the Healthcare Ethics, Humanities, Social Justice webinar series produced by Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine in conjunction with Misericordia University and the support of the National Endowment for Humanities. Uh, my name is Carly Elman and it is my pleasure to be your moderator for today's session. Again, we'll be recording um, the session for educational purposes. Please sign into the chat um, and close your um, video and mute yourselves for good for the best quality. So uh, human rights, including the right to health are grounded in protecting and promoting human dignity. Although commitment to human dignity is a widely shared value and precise meaning and requirements behind the term are elusive. It is also unclear as to how a commitment to human dignity translates into specific human rights, such as the right to the highest attainable standard of health and their scope and obligations. Today's session will focus on human rights and human dignity in medicine, which again is a very timely and important topic. We are pleased to have so many of you joining us from 20 states and over 12 countries. There are no financial disclosures or conflict of interest. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stacy Gallen, who is the founding director of the Maimonides Institute for Medicine ethics and the Holocaust. She is also a visiting assistant professor at New York Medical College in the Biomedical Ethics and Humanities Program and the director of the Center for Human Dignity and Bioethics Health and the Holocaust at Misericordia University. Dr. Gallen is the co-chair of the Department of Bioethics and, Hol and the Holocaust and the faculty member of the Department of Education of the UNESCO Chair of Bioethics. Through her role with UNESCO Bioethics, she has been part of organizing the committee for a series of international webinars focusing on the global ethical response to COVID-19. Along with the Davidson College star basketball play player, Kellen Grady, Dr. Gallen recently started a social justice initiative called College Athletes for Respect and Equal Equality Care with the goal of educating and empowering athlete activists to use their platform to help promote equality, justice, and tolerance for all people. Also help me welcome Dr. Skylar Walks. She is the Assistant Dean of Diversity, Equality, Accessibility, and Inclusion in the College of Pharmacy at the U University of Texas at Austin, who champions critical dialogue with the hopes of impacting positive change within shared communities. As an educator who works across K through 20 trajectories, including adult and community education, both domestically and internationally with various populations, she aims to engage learners in formal, non-formal and informal spaces. Complemented by her background in social services and um, breath with and with of her professional experience consists of nonprofit and for-profit project management, educator coaching, and training account management, K-12, K to 16 curricular su support, special and disability education, adult education in initiatives, English language learners, and social justice reform through community outreach and activism. Um, Dr. Walk's work encompasses several international projects for schools, regional libraries, and diversity community education for numerous entities, including the United States Embassy in Madrid, Spain, diversity abroad, and Southwest region of the Anti-Defamination League. And I'll turn it over. Well, first and foremost, welcome everyone. Again, thank you so much for joining us. It's truly a privilege and an honor to be here. 
I think more so now than ever before, when we talk about the complexities involved in understanding and truly building empathic connections around human dignity, we are at a paramount um, in terms of our national and international discussion. So at the completion of this activity, we hope that you'll be able to feel that you've successfully been able to accomplish at least three outcomes, perhaps even more. But for now, that would be to explain and apply the concepts of human dignity and human rights in medicine and healthcare overall, of course, understanding the relevance of these concepts in the context of medical education, practice, policy, and bioethics, but again, in a very practical, tangible way. And then finally, examining the Holocaust and American slavery as the historical framework for exploring the ramifications and implications of placing scientific and or societal progress over the promotion of individual wel welfare and human dignity. Again, these are our outcomes for today, but hopefully you'll be able to, to take away some of the things that we'll discuss and apply them more broadly, not only in your profession, but also in your epistemological frame to your worldview. Next slide, please. One of the first things I'd like to underscore to the group is as an accessibility advocate and professional, I read the majority of words on my slide. I absolutely am cognizant as a former uh, cross-examine and Lincoln Douglas debater in uh, UIL that you're never supposed to do that. But one of the reasons why I do that is because I never know who's in the room. I never wanna make assumptions about who has access visually to the content on the slides. So I'd like for you to bear with me. I'll be mindful of time, of course, but I'll be reading the majority of the text from the slides. And of course, there'll be some discussion that complements what's written here. So first and foremost, language matters. For whatever reason, language can be very intimidating for folks, particularly with respect to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility and justice discourse. I think it can be intimidating for many of us because quite frankly, the language is constantly evolving. It's constantly changing. And for most of us, we don't want to offend. We wanna make sure that we get it right. We wanna make sure that we're inclusive or at least as inclusive as possible as we are in the way in which we name things. But regardless of that trepidation that so many of us have, it's important that we do three things. We have to name it because when we name it, we can identify it. We have to call it out and calling it out doesn't mean that we're shaming or humiliating others or we're shaming or, humili or humiliating the subject and or object in the discussion, but we're calling it out because we want to make sure that everyone involved in the dialogue is aware of what we see and what we're discussing in the context involved. And then finally calling it in, and this speaks to my previous point, we all make mistakes in this work, even those of us who are credited professionals, we make mistakes because we're still on a journey of self-discovery. But when we have the courage to call one another in around our mistakes, around correcting and redirecting perhaps some of the missteps that we make in this work, we're doing that from a place of restoration. We're doing that from a place that aims to essentially heal and restore. We're not doing that from a place of humiliation or shame. So again, to engage themes of diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, and justice, because again, all of these things are within the auspice of justice, we should familiarize ourselves with some terms and explore how we can consider their integration into both space, place, and curriculum. Because the bottom line is, regardless of whether we are medical professionals who are practitioners, we always have an opportunity to teach. And those of us who are both and, we should certainly make sure that we make an effort to bridge the gap, to again, um, to somehow reconcile the theory with the practice, which is critical in this work. So I'd like for us to review a few terms and I'd like for you to share, again, you can do so in the chat um, or you can unmute. I'd like for you to share how you use these terms if you have in your curriculum, in your learning communities with other colleagues and in your communities at large, even with patients. Next slide, please. 
So we have some terms here, ally. I'll start with this one. An ally is someone who uses their privileged identities to support, validate, advocate for, and amplify the voices of those whose identities are marginalized. So that's pretty straightforward. And again, I wanna make sure that I underscore that these are simplified definitions for diversity, equity, accessibility, inclusion, and justice terms. These are not drilled down in a very esoteric way. But I really wanna make sure that I highlight something about ally. We've heard that term a lot lately, but here's the rub. You cannot self-define yourself as an ally, right? It's not something that you can self-identify as. In other words, it's not exactly appropriate in terms of justice work to say, I'm an ally for X group, or I'm an ally for, for Y or Z group. Essentially, the term ally is something that's bestowed, if you will, upon others as a consequence of their efforts of support, largely based on the advocacy work and the support that they offer and assuming risks as members of a privileged identity group. So in other words, I'll break this down for us. As someone who is a staunch ally to the LGBTQIA plus community, that is not a term that I self-identified as. That was, a, that was a term that was essentially given to me by members of the community who were able to essentially uh, uh, substantiate my work in the community and also recognizing that because I held privilege as a cisgendered uh, straight identifying woman that I could interrupt spaces in my and from my position of privilege as an ally for LGBTQIA plus persons who are experiencing marginalization. So this is really important. It's not something that we self-proclaim, it's something that's bestowed upon us. I always like to say we're knighted as such. You're knighted as an ally as a consequence of your work. Anti-racism is pretty straightforward. Awareness again, straightforward, a state of being conscious of something. Community, a social group of any size whose members often have a common cultural historical heritage, conscious bias. And again, I'm gonna push back a little bit around conscious, unconscious, implicit bias. You'll typically hear me just refer to bias as bias because quite frankly, and again, I'm not saying this for provocation's sake, bias is something that we cannot always determine that individuals are attributing to or framing their understanding of interpersonal interaction and engagement from a space of being unconscious or implicitly aware. Sometimes bias is enacted upon others from a very conscious place. And I think it's important for us to make that distinction. Dissonance again, the uneasy feeling you get from holding two conflicting beliefs, ideas, or emotions, indigenous, intersectionality, and most specifically, well, I'm, I'm gonna go back to intersectionality here. It's again, a buzzword that we've heard everywhere, intersectional, intersectionality, but I do want to make sure that I really stress Intersectionality does not mean multiple identities. It is not synonymous with multiple identities. Rather, intersectionality speaks to the ways in which oppressed identities, two or more, for example, oppressed identities around race, class, gender, sexuality, sexual orientation, ability, national origin, citizenship status, etc., are interconnected and cannot be examined without their connections to each other. So in other words, we can have intersectional identities, but also maintain and have privileged identities. So again, I'll use myself as a reference point here. As a self-identifying black woman who lives and was born in the United States of America, I experience a high degree, a high degree of privilege around my education as someone who holds an advanced degree or multiple advanced degrees. I hold a high degree of privilege. I call it passport privilege. Uh, well, up until recently um, around being able to travel relatively freely across borders, if you will. And I also hold a high degree of privilege around food security, socioeconomic status to a degree. Not that I'm wealthy, but in terms of my position of marginality in the world, there's a degree of privilege that I hold there. However, 
I also hold a high degree of marginalization around my race identity and my gender identity. As a woman and as a black identifying person, I hold a high degree of marginality around those two identities. And thus, those are my intersectional identities. Because when experiencing marginalization or oppression, it's very difficult to disentangle or untether the, the oppression experience as a consequence of my identity as a woman in a patriarchal society in male dominated world versus the experiences of oppression or marginalization as a black identifying individual, right? When we understand that there is systemic racism um, that largely constitutes the way in which our world and structures operate, particularly with you within a US context. So then we have what we hear often as BIPOC or black indigenous and people of color communities. This is a plural and inclusive form of person of color. Typically, we don't just see, say people of color anymore or person of color unless we're speaking to a broader frame. And that's primarily used in the United States to describe and encompass any person that is not white. So it's also used in addition to this to underscore the different socio-historical and political experiences of said groups within the United States context without monolithic conflation, right? So the indigenous experience is different than the black experience and also different than perhaps, again, if unless we're using it intentionally to be all encompassing of the general people of color experience. So we don't wanna conflate those unfairly. Thank you. Next slide. These are pretty straightforward. Again, we have protest. Again, this is not to be confused with riot. These two terms have been used interchangeably and we need to disrupt that. Queer, again, which is a term that's evolved, not necessarily for all members of the community, but by and large, it's an umbrella term used uh, oftentimes by LGBTQIA plus members of the community to refer to the entire community. But we have to be cognizant that because of the historical associations with that word, it also may be problematic with some members of community as well. Race. A social construct, yes, meaning it was constructed in a way that is largely based on a societal explanation for interaction and interpersonal understanding and relationships. However, while race is a social construct, the impact of it on individuals' lives is very real. The impact it has on structures and systems, very real. Resistance, pretty straightforward, self-care, social justice, systemic, and then systemic racism. And I'll underscore this one here. Systemic racism is a form of racism expressed in the practice of social and political institutions governed by behavioral norms reflected in disparities regarding such things as wealth, income, criminal justice, employment, housing, healthcare, political power, and education. Thank you. Next slide. Dr. Gallen, take it away. Thank you very much, Dr. Walk. Um, and I really appreciate your comment about the need to name things. And I think that actually dovetails really nicely into uh, the concept of human dignity. And when we talk about human dignity and human rights, I think that the concept, when people hear the words human dignity, and human rights, in theory, it seems like something that people can get behind. Can everyone uh, hear me? Can you, um, Carly, can you just make sure that everyone, I don't know if you can monitor this in the chat just to make sure that everyone's able to hear this because I see some people uh, sending me messages that say they are unable to hear this. Um, so Carly, just let me know if there are any issues on your end. Um, I can so, hear you. Okay. So just let me know if any anyone in the chat. Perfect. Looks like okay. a lot of people can hear you. Excellent. Thank you so much. So when we talk about the concept of naming something, before we can talk about human dignity and human rights and how those concepts can be applied, we need to understand what they mean. So um, we need to, again, to go back to what Dr. Walks was saying, reconcile theory with practice. So human dignity has often been considered a theoretical principle upon which the idea of human rights rests. So human rights then becomes the practical application 
of the theoretical principle of human dignity. So um, the idea here is that it reflects a concern for the need to promote both respect for the intrinsic worth of the individual and the integrity of humankind as a species. That's um, important to understand because we're talking both of, um, from the micro level and the macro level. So on the individual level of human dignity and human rights, what, what are you owed as an individual? And then what are you owed in terms of humankind as a species? The Universal Declaration on Bioethics and Human Rights, which we refer to as the UDBHR, um, places respect for human dignity first and foremost in the list of principles that should govern the field of bioethics. So um, Article 3, which I, I understand I say it's placed first, but it's Article 3. It's just the way it is, so bear with me says that human dignity, human rights, and fundamental freedoms are to be fully respected, and the interests and welfare of the individual should have priority over the sole interest of science or society. So you can see here that both the individual, the intrinsic worth of the individual, and the integrity of humankind as a species are being discussed here. And later on in this presentation, when we talk about putting this in, term, in a historical concept, when we, when we talk context, when we talk about American slavery and the Holocaust, it becomes more clear why there is a need to talk about prioritizing the interest and welfare of the individual over the sole interest of science or society. In terms of, uh, there, it's not just this document, it's multiple documents that reference human dignity as being the central aim. But the problem, when we say, name it, right? We're saying human rights is important. We're saying it's the most important, but we're never explicitly defining what human rights are, what human dignity means. Next slide, please. And so um, without going over the entire history of how we got to this point, Currently, this is the accepted definition that we are using for human dignity, which ties very closely in with contemporary international humanitarian, humanitarian law. Human dignity is strongly connected with human rights. They kind of go both ways. Um, it, it's a chicken or the egg kind of thing, which when you talk about which one came first and which is, 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 uh, which is founded on which. So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was published in 1948 by the UN uh, as a direct result of the atrocities uh, that were committed during the Holocaust, states all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. The European Convention on Human Rights and Biomedicine, Article 1, again, there, it's not a coincidence that you're seeing these are all <laughs> Article 1, uh, states that the purpose of the document is the protection of the dignity and identity of all human beings and guarantees everyone without discrimination, respect for their integrity and other rights and fundamental freedoms with regard to the application of biology and medicine. So what we're seeing here is the implication that human dignity is the basis for asserting certain rights. So human dignity is a supreme value on which all human rights and duties are said to depend. So if you had a pyramid, for example, human dignity would be the foundation of this pyramid and everything else rests on the idea that as members of humankind, without discrimination, we are all entitled to certain things because we all possess human dignity. Next slide, please. Okay, but there are some issues with this definition, right? And I think the first one uh, is probably the one that most people would be able to just take out of, out of the last slide. The meaning, the content, and the foundations of human dignity are never explicitly defined. And that leaves all of these documents open to criticism because that foundation of the pyramid, which is supposed to be the strongest, right? If you don't really understand what that is, then that foundation is a little shaky. Um, and how can you build the pyramid on a shaky foundation? So when we talk about affirmations of human dignity found within contemporary humanitarian law, what we're actually talking about is, is this is reflecting um, a political consensus among a variety of different groups that may have vastly differing beliefs regarding the exact definition, the genesis, the history, 
and the variety of ways that the term can be applied. So what we're really saying here is that the base of this pyramid, human dignity, is actually a placeholder for, quote, whatever it is about human beings that entitles them to basic human rights and freedoms. So that's tricky because we're really not providing a solid definition. There are no clear and unambiguous guidelines then for dealing with bioethical controversies if we are saying we're going to appeal to human dignity, if that is going to be the foundation for some of these things. Next slide, please. So then the question becomes, how can human dignity be defined as a useful concept? How can we strengthen that foundation of the pyramid? We need some type of ethical standard for the treatment of human beings. And again, when we talk about American slavery and we talk about the Holocaust, that becomes clear in practice, why we need some type of ethical standard for the treatment of human beings. Obviously, there are many, many other examples, but we're just going to give you two today. This requires a conception of what human beings are and what they are entitled to merely as a result of being human, of being members of humankind. But that has to be understood in relation to the purpose of use. So again, to go back to Dr. Walk's point before, there is a, a very, very strong need here to reconcile theory with practice. Next slide, please. And that really is what it boils down to. The fact that the notion of human dignity is so broadly defined can be seen by some as a criticism. It, it is a, we, we don't have an actual definition. So this pyramid is shaky, but it can also be seen as a strength because it becomes useful for the purpose of a public document that is being used by people all over the world. It's a way to express moral agreement among those from a very diverse cultural, religious, and moral tradition who may differ about how best to explain why human beings deserve respect, but yet all agree that they do deserve respect. And when you look at it from that way, it strengthens the foundation of that pyramid. And so in essence, and I may be misusing uh, Dr. Walk's terms from earlier here, but I I'm going to hope that she will, uh, she will be generous and allow me to uh, interpret this. We're calling out the fact that yes, we don't have an explicit definition. We, are, we, we understand that, we're calling that out, uh, but we're also gonna call it in, right? We're also gonna say, however, um, we're gonna take that and, and we understand that, but we're gonna find a way to, to make it so that it is inclusive and that we are able to use it in a practical sense. Because, and this, this quote here I think uh, is, is very strong. After all, what mattered most after 1945, so after, after the Holocaust ended, was not reaching agreement as to the theoretical foundations of human dignity, but ensuring as a practical matter that the worst atrocities inflicted on large populations during the war, so for example, concentration camps, mass murder, and slave labor would not be repeated. In short, the inviolability of human dignity was enshrined in at least some of these documents chiefly in order to pre prevent a second Holocaust. So it's okay if we can't give you the most explicit definition possible, because we understand that the important thing is that we need something. We need something that speaks to the idea of an inclusive human dignity that can be used in practice. And with that, I turn it over to Dr. Walks for her next slide. First and foremost, perfect use of terms, Dr. Gallen. So uh, you're, you get full kudos there, absolutely. I fully support it, brilliantly done. So here's a point that I wanna make when we talk about the practical application that Dr. Gallen just spoke to you about. The personal in terms of identity is political. That's uncomfortable for a lot of us to admit. And quite frankly, there could be some dissonance even experienced there because we think of political oftentimes as framed by politics or uh, identity with politics. This is not that. So let me be sure, particularly with this week in mind, to underscore that point. But identity is political because it's oftentimes enclosed in an understanding or shrouded in an understanding, if you will, that includes the historical, social, and emotional psychological impact that our identities have 
and, they're, and the ways in which they're juxtaposed alongside power and privilege or oppression and marginalization. I speak with my hands. I, I realize like that's, pro that's probably doing a lot for a lot of you out there, annoying you. I, I apologize, I can't help it. I um, do too, so that's not helpful either. You have both of us doing that. <laughs> I realize I'm, I'm grabbing at people's faces in the screen. So my apologies, I'm, I'm vibing with you here. But the first thing I want us to do is I want us to unpack this in a very real way, in a very personal way. So you have before you a social identity wheel, okay? And you have roughly 10 identities. If you, if you, if you can do it, Draw a quick circle. If not, it's fine. You can just ready reference this visual. But if you can think about a circle and each identity being a slice, we'll, we'll use those identities or describe those as first at 12 o'clock, if you think about it as a clock, ethnicity, socioeconomic class, gender, sexual orientation, age, national origin, first language, physical, emotional, developmental dis uh, ability and or disability, religion or spiritual affiliation, and race. Now, I want to underscore that you can add to any of these identities that you feel are that you represent that are not represented in this wheel. Add those. That's fine. There's plenty of, of pie to go around. You can add those because we're more complex than pre-prescribed categories. We recognize that. But here's, here's what I really want you to do. This is where we get into the crux of the practical application. Once you've written your personal identities around this pie or clock, whatever analogy you want to use here, I want you to rank these from one to 10, okay? Think about this rank in terms of the identities you think about the most often as number one to the identities you think about the least often as 10. Okay, so let's just take about 20 seconds to do that. Again, one, if you're thinking about a spectrum, one would be the identity that you think about the most. 10, the identity that you think about the very least. So since we don't have the gift of time lapse, we're gonna pretend that exactly 18 seconds have gone by. So again, if you didn't get an opportunity to do that, please feel free to come back to this because it, I think it's a, a really challenging and at least self-interrogating uh, exercise to do. I've done it many times, but I'd love to hear from you in the chat. Again, please don't feel pressured, but I'd love to hear from you. What were some of the identities that you ranked high in terms of thinking about the most often, like your one to three? What were some of those identities that came about? That's okay. We've got to, we've, you're, you're, you're a contemplative group. I can respect that. I appreciate that. I do want to offer an opportunity for you to share the identities that you thought about the least or that in this reflection act, activity, you realize you think about the least. Because here's the thing. Most of us just move through the world as we are. We're not always conscientiously thinking about, oh, I think about this identity more. I think about this identity less, which is one of the reasons reasons why self-interrogation is really important when you're talking about justice work. So I'll ask you, um, Dr. Gallen, I hope you don't mind me putting you on the spot here, but I, I'd love if you would share maybe uh, an identity that you thought about the most in your top three, one of those, if you're comfortable. Sure. There's a few, sorry, Dr. Gallen, there are a few participants. Um, someone stated one race, two gender, three religion, uh, 10 socioeconomic status, someone else said race, gender, first language. Awesome, thank you, that's super helpful. So here's the part two, right? When you think about the way in which we rank our identities, typically, and again, you can challenge this, but typically the identities that we think about the most are the identities around which we hold a degree of marginal, marginalization or marginality. The identities that we tend to think about the most, okay? The identities that we tend to think about the least are typically, not always, but typically the identities around which we hold a greater degree of privilege. For example, 
as a temporarily able-bodied individual, and I say temporarily able because my great grandmother used to always say, just keep living, right? As, as we age, uh, our, our abilities may change and shift also temporarily. We may uh, have a condition or be involved in an accident that impacts mobility, for example, or had a surgical or procedure, et cetera. But these things can evolve. Um, so the way in which we attend to them can also evolve. But when we think about the identities that we think about the least, so I think I heard in their socioeconomic status, I wanna ask you, could that be because you hold a certain amount or degree of privilege around that identity? Might that be one of the reasons why you think about it the least or ability? If that's one of the things that you think about the least, is it because you hold a certain amount of privilege around it or even religion or spiritual affiliation? Let's think about the ways in which we acknowledge even religion or religious holidays in professional environments, which ones are assumed as the dominant context, which ones are discarded or not even considered as a primary reference, but secondarily or even tertiarily or only considered when it's brought to the organizational leadership's attention. These are considerations we have to make because, and I'll share this nugget here, identity must go beyond the clinical and intellectual associations that we use to inform context, our own intrapersonally and interpersonally, as well as our macro context, right? So rather a holistic approach to understanding all of the identities that individuals hold and ourselves as well, help us to better understand our reality and ultimately our and others' proximity to power, privilege, and or their experiences with oppression and marginalization. I know that was a little deep and it may feel a little, a little stretched to make that connection, but I really want us to apply that because not all of us have the same ranking. And that in and of itself tells us a lot about how we see ourselves and our positionality in the world contextually impacted or influenced by how we show up in the world. Next slide, please. So this brings us to Sankofa, a word that I, I love and you, you're at home with me now, but I actually have this very bird in my house on the wall. Sankofa is a term, it's an African word from the Akan tribe in Ghana. And the translation of the word and the symbol that you see represented here are interpreted as go back and fetch it. And you'll see it's a bird with the neck craned towards the back and the beak looking like it's touching or about to grab an egg on its back, right? So that's the visual. And again, this is interpreted as go back and fetch it return to your past. It's not taboo to fetch what is at risk of being left behind. And the word is derived from the word sun, which is to return, ko, to go, and fa, to look, seek, and take. This is largely about our ability and need to return to the past. And this is largely rooted in truth and reconciliation to restore our movement and advancement towards the future. So in other words, we'll learn the gems of our past, but we'll also and can learn the atrocities of our past to inform and influence what we do in the present and to impact as well the future. Next slide, please. Thank you. So when Dr. Walks and I uh, first spoke about how we were going to approach this presentation, what we were able to figure out is that we have a lot in common. Um, and even though we also have differences, I always like to say that there's more that, that unites us. If you really sit and you really talk to somebody, there's more that unites us than there is a, that divides us. And so when we started talking about um, this, this slide that, that Dr. Walks just showed you, I started telling her a little bit about one of the concepts that I work with, uh, which is called the door of the door, which uh, in Hebrew, translates to from generation to generation. Um, and uh, this is, is something, this Hebrew phrase is something that we look to for inspiration regarding how to utilize historical lessons to inform contemporary practice. So you can see that there's a lot of similarity there. The expression refers to the essential task in Judaism, 
of passing down traditions and education from one generation to another. So it's how we honor our ancestors by telling their stories and our stories to our children and encouraging them to build upon the library of stories as they talk to their children. It's particularly important as a mechanism for preserving the memory of those who lost their lives during the Holocaust and making sure the world never forgets. So, um, and again, I've said this in each of the previous webinars and I think it bears repeating. When we are, and particularly um, with everything that Dr. Walks has said up to this point, when we are talking to you, we are coming with our own background and, and things you know, in our own social identity wheel that, that kind of define us. And so my background, uh, my educational background, I deal a lot with bioethics and the Holocaust. And now the PowerPoint is gone. Um, but fortunately, I happen to have uh, a copy in front of me. So what I'm going to say is that I deal a lot with, thank you. Uh, I deal a lot with bioethics and the Holocaust. And so I feel very strongly that uh, it is a responsibility to our ancestors, to those whose voices were silenced during the Holocaust. Uh, who were persecuted and killed for being Jewish, to tell their stories, to pass down their traditions, and to educate and empower the next generation. That's, to me, the concept of Lador Vador, to become active agents of social change who will fight for freedom, tolerance, and justice for all people. It is therefore incumbent upon us to give a voice to the generation before us who were silenced and to help the next generation uh, to find and amplify their voice. Um, Everyone has a voice. And this is something that Dr. Walks actually, uh, she taught me, is that everybody has a voice, but some voices are heard more than others. And I think that goes back to the idea, again, of you know privilege and power and where people sit in the hierarchy of privilege and power. So uh, part, of, part of what we can be doing, I guess, um, in terms of the idea of being an ally is you know, to help kind of amplify these voices. And so this idea here, which I think fits to both what Dr. Walks was saying with Sankofa and also the concept of the door of a door. Remember the past, protect the future, act now. Next slide, please. And so that brings us to the idea of how, you know, this hierarchy of human life, when we're talking about the power dynamics and things like that, there are certain characteristics throughout history that society has deemed to be favorable. And uh, unfortunately, science and medicine are sometimes used as the justification for the labeling, persecution, degradation, and mass atrocities inflicted upon those deemed inferior, unfit, or unworthy. And historically, these ju judgments have been based on a variety of factors. So economic worth, for example, the value of the individual to society is based on their ability to provide goods or services, or hereditary worth, where the value of the individual to the health and progress of society is based on inherited traits. So this is something that um, we've seen, again, in the examples that we're going to use, both in terms of what took place during the Holocaust and the example of American slavery. And what you see here is the political, ideolo political ideology combined with the idea of scientific justification and then the medical or the technological capabilities to carry those things out leads to the promotion of discriminatory policies under the guise of scientific or societal progress. So when we're talking about the importance of human dignity and human rights, right? this is why we need to talk about these things because historically speaking, we've seen them happen before and we can still see the hierarchy of human life that continues to exist. Next slide, please. Great, thank you so much for that. So here's something that, again, we were very intentional about the ways in which we paralleled these two. Again, we were not conflating them, but we wanted to make sure that we were able to draw parallels because again, it's about the ways in which the social and the political have been able to dehumanize the oppression of a people through slave labor. So if you'll, if you'll look here, you'll see that we have a quote, and this is actually based on our, our work and experience, this is actually a photo, it was actually taken from Sauschenhausen, which is a concentration camp that I visited some years ago. And you'll notice the words here. The translation or interpretation, if you will, are work will set you free, okay? And I have a quote here that I want to further explicate 
um, around this point. Again, identifying the parallels around systemic persecution and the dehumanizing oppression of a people through slave labor is that, quote, less well known is the fact that the Nazi program included some 1600 forced labor operations. During the 12 years of the slave regime, millions slaved and perished within them. Again, go back to this notion of work setting you free. So in other words, there is not an assumption, if you will, with this very clear example, that liberation, liberty, is not a human right. You can work towards it through slave labor and inhumane oppression. Somehow it's something to attain or obtain based on your labor. Your labor as understood as less than human. Now let's parallel this or juxtapose it against that around slave labor with African-Americans and black folk in the United States context. Here we have another quote, again from the narrative of the life of uh, Frederick Douglass. We were all ranked together, uh, excuse me, we we're all ranked together at the valuation. Men and women, old and young, married and single, were ranked with horses, sheep, and swine. There were horses and men, cattle and women, pigs and children, all holding the same rank in the scale of being. Notice being, not human being, okay? All, uh, and all were subjected to the same narrow examination. Silvery-headed age and sprightly youth, maids and matrons, had to undergo the same indelicate inspection. At this moment, I saw more clearly than ever the brutalizing effects of slavery upon both slave and slaveholder. So again, Douglas here posits, I think, a, a position worth noting is that when we when we explore human dignity and we look at individuals who can thus enact a, the, the, the determined removal of humanity from another human being, they de facto are becoming less humane. So it's actually both groups that suffer. Those, I'm not comparing here, I'm not saying, one, I'm not saying that they suffer the same, but I think that's an important distinction to make. For those who are, in, who are capable or choose to enact the removal of humanity from another human being are in fact becoming less humane. At the same time, those of course who are, are having the oppression of slave labor visit upon them are of course uh, treated as uh, inhumane and not considered to, to have human dignity. So again, I'll end with this, when a society is able to distance aspects of the human experience from its members, things that are collectively shared across humanity, okay? Even the more emotionally abstract here, like love, pain, loss, suffering, et cetera. And the 1619 Project did a really good job of historically positioning this discussion. So I recommend going there for some additional context and references, uh, references as well. When that happens, humanity itself is distanced along with it. That's important for us to understand. When we are able to see a people as one dimensional, laborers only, worthy and capable of nothing more than production and are thus subhuman, as is for example, the three fifths of all persons from the three fifths compromise clause in the United States constitution for 1787 in the United States, then they are treated as less than human. So again, this is not strictly a paradigm that's informed by emotionality. It is also one that's informed by history and, polit and the political narrative of a governing body. Next slide, please. So here we have some clear examples and I, I won't spend too much time on this. I wanna make sure that we get through all the slides in enough time, but we have here um, the, uh, objectifying bodies through brutalization and experimentation, the lasting impact with the Tuskegee experiment. And also Sarah Bartman, um, who is represented in the drawing at the right. So I, I wanted to use these particular examples to highlight my point, which is that again, Sarah Bartman, we'll start again with the drawing on the right, uh, who is a woman from South Africa. And she was also known as the hot and tot Venus. She was brought to Europe in 1810 and exhibited in Britain and in France where she died of smallpox at the end of 1815. 
A cast was made of her body after her death and her skeleton and organs were preserved by George Cuvier. Her remains were then returned to South Africa in 2002. She's portrayed in several prints um, by the British Museum and notably satires, which can be traced in the catalog of political and personal satires. This is important because we have to understand that again, human dignity also has to do with gaze the way in which we position ourselves to see and make subject object. Here uh, to the left, we have the Tuskegee experiment, which was a study, and we all know, for those of us in academia, we all know uh, the IRB, the painful IRB experience. Well, it's rooted in something to, to insist that there is a maintaining of human dignity in research because the Tuskegee experiment was a study initially that involved 600 black men, 399 with syphilis and 201 who did not have the disease. And the study was actually conducted without the benefit of patients informed consent. Researchers told the men that they were being treated for bad blood, which was a local term used to describe several um, ailments like syphilis, anemia and fatigue. And in truth, they did not actually receive the proper treatment needed to cure their illness. This particular experiment lasted for 40 years, okay? Again, 40 years. So I want us to be mindful of the impact, not as history so distant in the 19th century, but also the recent history of the 20th century. Next slide, please. So really quickly, um, when we talk about intersectionality, which I hit before, I want us to also think about forced and involuntary sterilization, which has come to the forefront yet again uh, with respect to what's happening at detention centers uh, along the borders of the country. So really quickly here, folks who were targeted historically, and this also happened in concentration camps, um, but within the US context here, individuals with disabilities, poor women and black women. And I'll, I'll read this quote, sterilization rates for black women rose as desegrega desegregation got underway. So until the 1950s, schools and hospitals in the United States were segregated by race, but integration threatened to break down Jim Crow's apartheid. And the backlash involved the reassertion of white supremacist control and racial hierarchies, specifically through control of black reproduction and future black lives by sterilization. Next slide, please. Thank you so much, Dr. Walks. Um, so when we talk about human dignity, um, basically we want, we want to end this presentation by talking about what can you do um, as healthcare practitioners? Um, what are some things that you can do? And I think when we're seeing this here, we're seeing um, the, the clinical encounter is a confrontation. Uh, it's a face-to-face, encounter between someone who professes to heal and someone who, uh, technical difficulties. Okay, we're, we're gonna go to this slide because this slide, we're not, we're not gonna go to that slide. One way or another, we're gonna figure out which slide we're gonna go to. You can go past this one, that's fine. You can go straight to slide 22, I think will be perfect. So let's talk about the practical implications for the daily clinical encounter. So uh, what can we do? It's really important to enhance a doctor-patient relationship by reminding healthcare professionals that each patient is a human being. So not a diagnosis or a case or a room number or a disease, right? Each person is a person, they're an individual. And that goes back to what we were talking about before, the very meaning of human dignity. Just by virtue of being a member of humankind, you are entitled to certain rights. Uh, you are entitled to be treated like a human being, not like a diagnosis or a case or a disease. Um, the second point I think is really, really important in light of some of the things that Dr. Walks touched on before. We need to acknowledge and recognize the historical patterns of dehumanization and the abuse of power that has led physicians to abandon their oath to respect the human dignity of all patients. So the concept of dehumanization is something that has been really, really important in the history of the abrogation of ethics that has taken place in the medical profession. Um, when you look back at any of the academic literature on you know, how healers became killers during the Holocaust, the word that comes up time and time again is the idea of dehumanization. Looking at 
people as if they were less than human. So um, when you look at propaganda, that's the other thing. When you were seeing some of these images that Dr. Walsh was showing us before, you know, to me, those are very similar to, to Nazi propaganda when you're seeing things that are making it seem as though people are less than. Again, the idea, the concept of a human a hierarchy, right? We need to understand that uh, this is something that's happened in humanity before. There are historical patterns and those patterns lead to uh, a mistrust and a distrust within the community. And so um, we need to understand how that type of generational trauma and mistrust informs the patient experience on multiple levels. So both on an individual level in terms of the relationship between the healthcare professional and the patient, and also in terms of a systemic level, who is likely to go and seek care, right? If you have constantly felt like you are part of a marginalized population that has been uh, unfairly treated by the healthcare profession, why would you want to go back to these people? Why would you think that these people can help you? Um, I received an email from a student not long ago uh, who was talking about uh, her grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor, uh, who married a woman who uh, was schizophrenic. And this student uh, told me that she never understood why her grandfather wouldn't take her grandmother to a doctor. But if you go back and you look at the history of the Holocaust and you look at what happened within the field of psychiatry and how many people with schizophrenia were, uh, were killed, they were seen as being unfit, hereditarily unfit, and they were killed. It became a lot clearer to her when she started hearing those stories. Her grandfather was trying to save her grandmother's life by not taking her for quote unquote help. He didn't look at it as being help. He thought if he took her to somewhere like that, he would never see her again. They would take her away and that would be the end of it. So these are things that we need to understand, generational trauma. And we also need to understand, again, going back to the idea of the social identity wheel, how might that affect the doctor-patient relationship? How might the way in which you know, people define themselves, their identities and, and the power differential that comes with that, how might that affect the doctor-patient relationship? Human dignity is a reminder that each patient is a person who deserves to be treated with respect and care, regardless of his or her gender, race, religion, socioeconomic status, et cetera. We need to remember that. We need to honor that. I would say not just in medical practice, but in society as a whole. And I do feel that today is a pretty good day to drive that point home, right? Um, as members of humankind, we're all entitled to be treated with dignity and respect, but that means that we also have a responsibility to treat others with dignity and respect. And that is the purpose of today's webinar. That is really what we wanna make sure that we can uh, impart on all of you, if I may. So uh, with that, I believe it looks like we are at the end of our time. Um, I believe if we go to the next slide, please, you will see that we have uh, some resources that we've used from this slide, which we are more than happy uh, to make available to you if you would like any more information about this. And um, then if we could go to the next couple of slides, we would like to thank uh, everyone who's been part of this entire webinar series. Um, this wouldn't be possible without each and every one of your help. And we are very, very fortunate to have your support and to be able to do something like this, which is so important, uh, again, particularly right now. And the final slide here, you can see that the next webinar on race, culture, and generational trauma in healthcare will take place on Thursday, December 3rd uh, at 12 o'clock PM Eastern time. So um, with that, I think that we are out of time. Um, and if anyone has any questions that we weren't able to get to, um, hopefully Carly will be able to um, give us those questions and perhaps we'll be able to answer them maybe via email. I believe that uh, we've seen in the chat, the CME credits, that you have to fill out. Carly, is there anything that you'd like to add about uh, any of the forms that anybody needs to fill out? No, please just sign out your name if you want um, CMEs or CEUs and also fill out the evaluation. Um, and there was one question in the beginning. I'll try to get that to you, um, but also our speakers' emails are on the screen. So if anyone does have any questions, I know they're willing to to answer those. Um. I just personally want to thank Dr. Walks. It was an absolute joy to do this presentation with you.
Um, and I think also very beneficial to people to have um, people from different perspectives speak on this topic to see again that uh, there's a lot there's a lot more that unites us than than that divides us. And I think um, that's a powerful point again when we're talking about a webinar on human dignity and human rights and the importance of kind of um, educating people on that, empowering people on that, and what we can do to help that. So, Dr. Walks, do you have any final words for us? I do. I just want to say thank you so much. This has been an absolute joy and honor. And again, in terms of relevance and timeliness, that we couldn't have had a better a better day. I think um, I'm happy to address the, if I have the time to address the question. Is that okay? There was one question. It says, uh, if using the word ally is not, an is not appropriate to self-profess, bestow upon myself, or use as a way to identify our position as an ally to others, what is the appropriate way to identify ourselves as a person who does, uh, who does uh, align themselves or ally work with specific marginalized groups? I absolutely think saying that I aim to be, or, or I, my work is that I aim to be an ally with this particular group. And then there's a humility that's understood that you're recognizing as someone who holds a position of power or privilege around that identity, that you are offering or proffering a degree of humility in saying, my work and who I am aims to serve and support, right, through allyship, this community. I think that's, it's, it's as, simple, as simple as that. Thank you so much. Um, someone did ask for the uh, resources um, that you guys um, put up. So I put that in the chat. I'll send it to everyone too. Um, and with that, thank you again so much um, for your presentation today and participating in this webinar series. And thank you to everyone um, who came. I hope everyone has a wonderful day.